exclamation point, exclamation point. For some of you, it's more like, it ain't over yet, question mark, question mark, <laughs> question mark. Uh, we will try to get everybody out of here in short order, so, so please be patient. Uh, we're going to look at the passage here that was assigned to me here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, so I trust you're there by now. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I like to read beginning there at verse 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning there at verse 13. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, Know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Let's pray. Father, again, we do thank you for your grace, your love, your goodness. We thank you, Father, for the work of Calvary, the blood that was shed there so richly and so freely so that we might have eternal life. And Father, we just pray that as we examine this particular passage of Scripture, may the cross work truly be the sole motive for living on to you. We pray that our time together would be an encouragement, edifying, and as always, may all things redound unto the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in his name we pray. Amen. Here the Apostle Paul is uh, defending himself once again. Second Corinthians is one of the strongest self-defense epistles written by the Apostle Paul. Paul, of course, is being challenged regarding his message. He's being challenged regarding his uh, appearance of all things, his ministry, his behavior. And uh, those are challenges that Paul meets without any real difficulty. But when you begin to read the passage that we just read, he's being challenged regarding his motives. And that has to be deep painful for the Apostle Paul. Uh, it gets real personal when you have an element there at Corinth actually questioning his motivation in ministry. So, well, Paul is hurt. He's frustrated. And you can uh, feel the frustration as Paul writes. So what the Apostle Paul here now does is lay out simply and clearly what his one singular motivation in life is. And it's all summed up there at verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. We're told that there are two kinds of power in the natural world. There is energy and there is resistance. We have energy like the ocean, where you have this fluid, flowing, dynamic source of power. You also have resistance, like a dam, like a wall. The wall doesn't do a whole lot. The dam, in and of itself, doesn't possess any kind of energy. All the wall does is resist. By the way, we get the word restrain from resistance. What the Apostle Paul here now is doing is demonstrating something about the work and the power of grace. What Paul is going to demonstrate that there is only one motive that God can ever accept when it comes to the work and the labor and the life that we're to express in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. That one singular, all-consuming motivation is based upon the unconditional love that is given by the grace of Almighty God. Grace is like an ocean. In that, it possesses this power. It possesses this positive energy. The law on the other hand, is like a wall. Isn't it interesting that the law is called the middle wall of partition? 
The law stands there, denies access. The law, as a restraining force, was designed to control and regulate man's performance. It truly is a performance management system. The law is described by the Apostle Paul as being a governor. It controls, it regulates. The law is described as being the yoke of bondage. The law was never intended to give life. The law in and of itself does not produce the capacity to energize and to bring to life the type of life that God desires his people to have. The type of power that is available is found in the grace of Almighty God. So when we read verse 14, right off the bat, Paul is demonstrating love is the only constraining influence that motivated him to live unto the Lord. That word constrain. Great illustration, by the way. Go to Job chapter 32. In Job chapter 32, um, it's not a difficult word, obviously. You see the word con with strain. The idea when uh, one is constrained, it carries with it that, uh, that pressure, if you will. It carries with it that force. It carries with it that, uh, uh, that tightening, uh, this, this compression which is intended to force something out. That isn't how the law works, by the way. In Job chapter 32, notice there at verse 18, for I am full of matter. This is Elihu writing. And uh, when he says I'm full of matter, he has something he needs to express. Matter as in subject matter. He's got some, some words that he wishes to impart. So we read there at verse 18, for I am full of matter. Now notice the spirit within me, what is it doing? constraining me he he's incapable of holding back now notice verse 19 behold my belly is as wine which hath no vent it is ready to burst like new bottles what a wonderful illustration when one is being constrained there is inherently an Energy, a dynamic, a spiritual capacity that is welling up. It's beginning to stir and fester. And just like in this illustration, when you have the sugar of the grape beginning to ferment, gases are produced. And in this illustration, if the gases are not vented, what happens to the container? What happens to the bottle? It's going to burst. We can use a two liter Bottle of soda, carbonated. You shake that bottle up, you know exactly what's happening with the gas inside of that bottle. You pop off the top, and there is a tremendous amount of internal energy now that is thrust forward. To be constrained carries the idea of possessing something internally that begins to, to ferment, if you will. It begins to well up. There is this inward pressure that now is to be released. So when we go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we learn that love is the very ingredient that literally possessed the soul of the Apostle Paul, captivated the very heart of the Apostle Paul, and provided the inner man energy that thrusted him into a life that he describes is unto the Lord. Now, I want to say something about this type of love. Now, here, of course, Paul, he's describing the love of Christ as it relates globally, universally to all men. But never lose sight of the fact that God's personal, individual love for each and every one of his own is intended to produce this constraining 
influence and positive energy, something the law could never do. Love is the inseparable companion of grace. Grace teaches that the love of God is unconditional. God's love is never in proportion to your performance or to your abilities or to your capacities. God's love is never meted out in proportion to your productivity. But rather, go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. When we learn something about God's love, it's never dependent upon us. In fact, when Paul talks about the love of Christ constraining him, he's writing it not to suggest or to teach that somehow we become indebted to God in, in, in the sense of duty and obligation and responsibility. That isn't what Paul is doing there. When he writes Second Corinthians here in First Timothy, chapter one, notice there at verse 14 and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant. And that exceeding you understand what Paul is saying here. When Paul describes the grace of Almighty God, he uses this language that communicates this tremendous, excessive hyper generous, pouring and abounding grace. But look, he, he, he continues to write, not only is the grace of our Lord exceeding abundant, but it's exceeding abundant with what? Faith and love. That love which is founded Upon the exceeding grace, this hyper generous grace of Almighty God. This is the type of love that Paul is describing when he says, I'm constrained to do what I do. This type of love, it's like a thirsty man who takes a drink from Niagara Falls. Paul could never get over that radical extreme, excessive love of Almighty God towards him. That's the response that God looks for. That's the response that grace produces. Not one out of a legalistic sense of obligation and duty, and now I am forever indebted to pay God back. God doesn't expect you to pay him back. It was paid in full, 100%. There is no debt that we now carry in life. But better yet, there is something that God works in the realm of our inner man that produces this constraining. You know, sometimes as grace believers, we're accused of being passive or, or even irresponsible. You ever heard that, you know, grace is just a license to sin? You know, some people think grace is a license to be lazy, to be irresponsible. You know what Paul is demonstrating? Paul says that I labored more than they all. How was Paul able to labor more than those other apostles? Paul says, it wasn't I, but... It was the grace of God that was in me. So Paul, again, he's not suggesting that, hey, you Corinthians, you got to get in line here and you better now be moved by this sense of indebtedness. Quite the contrary, pure, unadulterated, generous, excessive love. The law can never produce that kind of spirit. I want to just look at a couple of verses that that again highlight the excessiveness of God's love towards us. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Paul uses this extravagant language. Paul uses this excessive terminology when describing God's love. We are truly drinking from Niagara Falls. <laughs> 
when it comes to the love of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for his, what kind of love? Great love. And I understand the immediate context here. Paul's demonstrating some things about how God in his love is able to secure our eternal destiny through his son regarding the heavenly places and so forth. But Paul describes it as great love. If you go over to chapter 3, notice there in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ. Now, notice what Paul says, which passeth knowledge. Now, that seems like a contradiction here. Now, of course, again, in the context, Paul's talking about, hey, uh, we, we want to have our spiritual lives anchored and rooted where? In love. And then he goes on in verse 19. I want to know, to, to deeply, richly understand this love of Christ. Now, now I understand in verse 18, it has everything to do with this architectural design that God is laying out in the heavenly places. But look at verse 19, to know the love of Christ. But then he says, which path is, passeth knowledge. Isn't that an apparent contradiction? How can you know love? And yet that type of love passeth knowledge. Paul's not saying it's an unknowable type of love. What does it mean to know something and yet at the same time it passeth knowledge? He tells us in verse 20. Now to him that is able to notice, do exceeding abundantly. Oh, there's that excessive language again. To pass knowledge has everything to do with God's capacity to literally fulfill and accomplish that which he intends to fulfill and to accomplish. And the more we know about the love of Jesus Christ at this personal, deeper, richer level, it is a type of knowledge that actually accomplishes something. It's a working knowledge. And that's the idea here. And in fact, if you read verse 19 again, to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with the fullness of God. Now, obviously, Paul's not suggesting you can be filled with more God. What does it mean to be filled with the fullness of God? You know what God wants you to be full of? What did Elihu say back? I am full of matter, he said. God wants us to be full of this knowledge of the love of Jesus Christ. To be filled with the fullness of God. The fullness of God is the knowledge of the love of Christ. To be filled with that which he fills us up with. We really need to be full of it. In a good way. Full of love. A love that passeth knowledge. A love that accomplishes something in life. You see how grace motivation is a far superior motivation than the law motivation that stands as that impenetrable wall. And all it does is govern and regulate and look at the way you live. And it seeks to prohibit, and it seeks to control. You know, John Bunyan, 300 years ago, he wrote, Run, John, run, the law commands, but uh, gives us neither feet nor hands. Far better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. That's what the gospel of grace does. It gives us the very capacity to achieve and accomplish what, what God wants to achieve and accomplish. So when Paul says, be filled with the fullness, be filled with love. 
chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5. Notice there, of course, verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Now that word dear, it carries the idea of endearment. To be a dear child is to be literally the very object of God's consuming passion and adoration. To be a dear child is to be the focus of God's affection and pleasure. Why would Paul here say that we're to be followers of God as dear children? Verse 2, and walk in love. Isn't that a beautiful way of this? What does it mean to walk in? In love. He doesn't say love. To walk in it. In the realm. In the governing sphere. To walk in love. It truly means that's where we dwell. That's where we abide. That's where we reside. To walk in love. It's to operate under its influence, to operate under its direction, to operate under its gripping control. Walk how? In love. Love. You understand the world has clearly cheapened that word love. You know, modern psychology, you know how they view love? Love is like giving somebody a mirror and getting them to like what they see. You know. Modern psychological counseling techniques, it's nothing more than just sort of building up your self-worth and, and nothing more than just trying to get people to feel good about themselves, having a higher opinion of themselves, uh, a, a, a greater sense of self-esteem. That, that isn't the type of love that, that the Bible certainly is talking about. Go to Romans chapter 5. No, love, of course, in the Bible, you've heard it many times. It truly is this this value, this honor that God ascribes to us in and of ourselves. There isn't anything of value. There isn't anything of spiritual worth that we could ever produce. But it's God who is love, who chooses to ascribe the value and the worth and the honor. And grace says, the exceeding grace of God says, that God can choose to view you in highest regard, in highest esteem, because of that excessive, hyper-generous, unconditional love. It has nothing to do with whether or not you deserve it. It has everything to do with the nature and character of God. Romans chapter 5, in light of the love of God. Paul, in verse 5 of chapter 5, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. The love of God. His opinion of his own. His estimation of each and every one of us as dear children. The very object of his fondness. That love. The very love that resides in the heart and in the soul of almighty God. The highest regard. The highest sense of worth and honor. The very love that occupies and, and, and resides in the thinking of Almighty God is the same love that is to reside and occupy to same degree, in the same quantity, in the same understanding within our hearts, the very mentality of our soul, the very thinking we need to understand how much God truly loves and values us. Paul, the way he describes it, it's that love of God, that, that excessive, unconditional view that he has of us. 
which he sheds abroad. It traverses the very realm of heaven right out of the throne room of God. We know about it when we study about ourselves, when, when we study the word of God about it. That love, Paul says, it's shed abroad where? In our hearts. Paul understood how loved he was. And by the way, Paul continues and, and he describes something about that love of God. Look there at verse 8. But God commended his love toward us. You know what the religious system tries to provoke people to do. You need to commend your love to God. You need to prove your love to God. You need to demonstrate your love to God. That verse says that God commended his love. He's the one who makes that choice to love. The verse goes on and it says God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. Did God impose some unrealistic expectation upon the sinner? When God says, I'm going to commend my love. And he commends it while we were yet sinners. He didn't impose some expectation. Well, I'll tell you what. If you sincerely desire my love, then you got to jump through certain hoops. You got to perform. You got to produce. You got to maintain. You got to work. No. God's love. It's commended while we were yet sinners. It doesn't say stop it. it. doesn't say turn from it. While we were in our desperate, urgent predicament, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We were dead in trespasses and sins. And it was in that very state of spiritual death that God commends his love. He now demonstrates that he can choose to ascribe value and worth and regard and esteem. Don't stop being who you are. Be who you are while we were yet sinners. And then how was God's love commended? Christ died for us. God's love made provision. He provided for that need which the sinner has. That's love. And Paul, he could never get over that love. Paul is always bragging about that love. Go over to chapter 8 real quickly. Paul brings up that love again. And here in chapter 8, we read something there at verse 30, uh, 37. Look at there at uh, look there at verse uh, 30, 35. We, let, let's look there at verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Verse 39. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The greatest manifestation of the love of God is when he gave his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for the desperate sinner. It's not an issue of works. It's an issue of God's grace. And Paul, he would never get over that love. And that's why he writes where he writes there in First uh, uh, Timothy. But go back to Second Corinthians chapter 5. So, we need to understand, first of all, that the love that Paul's talking about is that generous love, that excessive love that uh, grace provides. And so with that, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, we read, For the love of Christ constraineth us. That's the motivation. Not duty, not debt, not obligation. Not some uh, spiritual response. It's just love that drove him to do what? We keep reading. 
Verse 14, for the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge. Now, not only is love generous, love is intelligent. You notice Paul says, we thus what? Judge. You see, to love, it, it, it's, beyond, it, it, it's not an issue of sentimentality and, 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 and emotion and, and feelings or anything like that. Here, the Apostle Paul, when he says, I know something about the love of Christ. And, and here's the determination he made. You know, when you come to a judgment, obviously he's referring to the realm of his thinking, not blind passion. But he made a judgment call. Well thought out, reasonable conclusion. What is it about the love of Christ which constrained him? Put that inner man pressure thrusting him to do something, surrendering and abandoning his past life. We thus judge that if he died for all, then we're all dead. Verse 15, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. You notice Paul here he talks about living unto him. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. To live unto him. Sunday night, Brother Richard, describing the relationship that exists between the Godhead. Remember what he said? Each member of the Godhead lives spontaneously for the benefit of who? Each other. You know what it means to live unto someone? If you want to get a technical dictionary definition, it doesn't say living for the Lord, but it does say living unto the Lord. That preposition, it's considered archaic. We don't use it all that often. In fact, it's sometimes considered obsolete. You know what it means to live unto him? It means that Paul, in this particular passage, made a willful, conscious determination in, him, in his life that he now is going to live for or unto the benefit and advantage and glory and eternal gain of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just as the Godhead lives spontaneously for the benefit of one another. You know what Paul here is saying? I now choose to live spontaneously for the eternal benefit, glory, and advantage of my Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul's judgment and conscious willful choice is this. I'm not going to live unto myself anymore. But I'm going to live unto him. Why? The love of Christ constrains me to respond in that way. Now, Paul, a number of times when he describes ministry, he demonstrates that he knew what life really was all about. You know, there is this quest for relevance and meaning and purpose and fulfillment in life, you know. And uh, true relevance True purpose, true meaning, true success, true fulfillment in life is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul, he, of course, uses specific language. Go to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. When Paul says, we are to henceforth live unto him. Paul's simply reducing Life to one singular purpose. And that purpose is a person. He writes, for example, to the Philippians, chapter 1, verse 20, according to my expectation, uh, my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also, Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. You talk about someone who is consumed with this 
passion in living on to the Lord for his eternal glory and benefit. Paul says that his life now is going to be a conduit. It's going to be a channel by which the life of his Savior is to be magnified. Now, we're familiar with different types of magnification. If you were a little kid, remember the old little magnifying glass where we tried to burn up ants and, and, and insects and, and so forth. And, and the way a magnifying glass works or a microscope works, it takes that which is small and makes it large. That's not the type of magnification Paul's talking about. There's another type of magnification, the telescope. And you know what the telescope does. The telescope, it captures the light of, of distant galaxies. The telescope will, will capture the light being admitted by the stars and the galaxies and the suns and the novas and so on and so forth. And it takes that light and it brings it into focus. It takes the splendor and the majesty and the, the awe of space and it makes it visible. It takes what appears to be vast and infinite and it makes it manifest. You can see it. It takes the invisible and makes it what? It makes it visible. Paul says, I want my life. To be like that telescope that takes the grandeur and the splendor and the awe and the majesty of his Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and bring it to focus so that people see not so much what he's doing, but they see the person. As Paul says, for to me to live is what? Christ. I was stationed in 1980 and 1981. I was stationed in Alaska. Uh, the Brooks Mountain Range, some of the most spectacular scenery you can imagine. It, I think in North America, Mount McKinley, I know, about 150 miles south and so forth. But, but, you know, out there in the Brooks Mountain Range, and literally we're on a radar site, so we're at the highest peak, the Brooks Mountain Range. Some of the most dazzling displays of, of sunset, sunrise, the, the aurora borealis, the, the northern lights. And, and, of course, we had all sorts of terrain. We had the wilderness, the ra, the, the streams and, and the rivers and uh, the tundra. Uh, we heard wolves once in a while howling out there, the moose and, and, and the, the bear and so forth. On that radar site, we had, of course, a recreational room. And attached to that recreational room was a weight room. And uh, you talk about contradictions, bit of a parable here. That weight room had mirrors on all four walls. And there was a group of us, we really enjoyed the outdoors. We did some hunting, camping, fishing. We, we did all sorts of things. I mean, if you're in Alaska, take advantage of it, right? I mean, you can step out of that site and you are in the mountaintop. There was a guy we were familiar with, tried to befriend him a little bit. He would spend hours every day in the weight room. And you know what he's doing in the weight room? Every wall had mirrors. And he would spend hours checking out his deltoids and his biceps and his glutes and his max and this and that and this and that. You know, and we tried to, hey, man, you want, you want to come on down? You know, we're going to tend out there by the river and so on and so forth. He said, no, 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 man, you know, I got to work. I got to do all this stuff. You know, one wall, we had sort of a picture window overlooking the Brooks Mountain Range. And here's this guy consumed, looking in the mirror, looking in the mirror, looking in the mirror. What a sad way of living. You know, when it comes spiritually to this issue of Christ being met, so many today believers, they would prefer to live in the house of mirrors. Instead of being that channel through which the splendor and the glory of Jesus Christ is made visible, revealed, displayed. So many of us, we're more comfortable in the house full of mirrors. And you know, when you're out there in the mountain range, you begin to, man, you, 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 you're just sort of struck by how small you are. But listen, God, when he talks about God, you know, Christ being magnified, the goal isn't to make you feel small and irrelevant. 
What God wants us to appreciate is, wait a minute, if I am a God that can give you life, if I am a God that can give you eternal glory, if I am a God that can give you the splendor and the vastness of his riches and the glory of of all these. What does Paul say in Romans chapter 8? Can he not also freely give us all things? God isn't in the business of making any one of us feel like little dust mites, you know, insignificant, nothing. No, to magnify Jesus Christ is to get a taste of the magnitude of what God is going to accomplish through the exceeding kindness and riches. It isn't intended to make us small. It's intended to love the one who loves us. That guy, all he did was spend hours every day and, and, you know, it's interesting when you're in that room full of mirrors, you know, you, you're the only guy in there. And, and, and you you appear bigger than you really are. There's a poem in the back of my uh, Bible. If I stand at the setting of the sun by the mountain range and before the vastness of the sea, how can I think everlasting joy? can ever come by making much of me. You know what Paul is communicating here, verse, when he says, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body. That's what Paul was consumed with. In chapter 3, if you go to Philippians chapter 3, notice what he says there in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, that I may know him that I might know him don't spend your time trying to figure yourself out Paul's estimation was Christ defines him Christ defines us doesn't he he's our all in all Paul says I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Again, all, Paul's all-consuming passion. I, I want to know him. In fact, if you just glance up verse 8, Paul says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and to count them but dung, that I may what? Win Christ. And he's not talking about getting saved, obviously. He's not saying, I want to win Christ onto eternal life. I want to win Christ in life, in service, in function. That's what Paul's talking about when he says, I want to win the Lord Jesus Christ. And look at verse 9. And be found where? In him. I want to be found in the very place and position that I have. Where? In the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you also notice, Paul says some things about death. Going back to chapter 1. In chapter 1, he of course says there that Christ will be magnified in his body, whether it be by life or by what? Death. You think, well, now, how is Christ magnified in death? It's a little bit easier maybe to grasp the idea of, well, Christ can be magnified in life, the type of life that I have, the, the type of uh, response that I have towards uh, his goodness and, and, and his grace. But how is it that Christ can be magnified by death? And Paul brings up that issue of death a number of times here. In the book of Philippians, obviously here we read it there in in chapter three. Uh, Glance over here, chapter two. Look at chapter two, verse eight. And you notice there in chapter two, verse eight, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto what? Death, even the death of the cross. If you drop down to verse 17, yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith drop down to verse 27 for indeed he was sick nigh unto death verse 30 
Because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto what? Death. You know how Christ can be magnified in Paul's body? It's the reason for that death. It's a death that is the consequence of service. Oh, we understand what it means to magnify Christ in life. You know, to know him, to to capture the splendor, to 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 actually adopt his sentiments, his persona, his view, his mentality, the way he thinks. That's how we live. That's how we magnify Christ. But wait a minute. How is Christ magnified? How do we capture the grandeur and the splendor of Christ in death? Doesn't death appear to be defeat? When Paul talks about Christ being magnified in death, he's talking about the service. That service of faith obedience. He's talking about the reason he's going to die or he might die. He's talking about faithfully serving the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in 2 Corinthians, we're familiar with chapter 4. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, when Paul describes some of the atrocities committed against him in, in, in ministry, The way Paul viewed his ministry, when Paul says, I'm going to live unto him, my life is no longer my own. He describes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. There's this issue of, of dying. Again, dying in ministry, dying in service, dying in service for the church, the body of Christ. Verse 11, for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So so then death worketh in us, but life in you. Christ can be magnified in death. If that death is in direct response and correlation to a life that willingly obeys by faith the instructions that are given by our Lord. Go to Galatians chapter 6. You know, Paul, by the way, he didn't have a death wish. Paul understood that there were natural consequences. You see, love is not only generous. Love is not only intelligent. Love is also costly. (laughs) In fact, love was violent. Love can be brutal. And Paul understood something about the love of Jesus Christ. The love of Jesus Christ for you was a brutal love, was a violent love. You know, the church, unfortunately, has tried to sanitize the cross. You know, Paul in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Again, you know, the church, by and large, they try to disinfect the work of the cross. You know, they try to try to diminish the the violence and the brutality that occurred there on the cross. You know, when Paul here in verse 14 talks about glorying in the cross, I don't believe he's saying I glory in the cross because that's the answer for my sin problem. And that's how I have eternal life, because he's talking about persecution. If you notice there in verse 12. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of who? You see, in the context, what Paul is communicating in the Galatians is this, that those legalists out there that would have you circumcised, they would never jeopardize their lives for a message that can result in persecution. Persecution. 
And so what Paul is contrasting is, look at those frauds, look at those counterfeits, all they're interested in getting something from you. Paul, on the other hand, he's not interested in getting anything from them. He's interested in giving something to them. And Paul, when he says, I glory in the cross, he's talking about the associated persecution. In fact, go back to verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross. Those legalists, they're ashamed of it. They're offended by it. They wouldn't hazard their lives. And notice what he says at the end of verse 14. By whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Paul recognized the brutality of that cross. And when Paul says, you know, the world means nothing to me anymore. The world's crucified unto me. It has no meaning. It has no real purpose. It has no relevance. Paul is not going to find fulfillment in the world. And not only does he say the world is nothing to me. He says, I mean nothing to the world. That was the world's estimation of Paul. He understood that based upon the world standard. In in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I love the way he describes it there in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. When Paul talks about magnifying Jesus Christ in death, he's talking about his willing association with the offensiveness, with the violence, with the brutality of the cross of Jesus Christ. He is willing joyfully to suffer the afflictions. Of the cross. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 16. To the one we are the savor. Of death. Unto what? Death. What Paul's describing. Is you know. We come along and we preach that gospel message of Jesus Christ and the work of grace and the work and the achievements of the shed blood there on Calvary. And and, you know. The unbelieving world their response is they smell nothing but death onto what death they view their estimation of paul is how in the world can you live for some fantasy some message regarding a dead jew because that isn't what life is supposed to be about. Life is supposed to be about gain. Life is supposed to be about comfort. Life is supposed to be about prosperity. Life is supposed to be about ease. Paul, that's not what he determined to do. He determined to live unto him that loved him. And that life is going to be a costly life. It's going to be a risky life. And in Paul's situation, it was a very dangerous life. Can you imagine preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago there in the Roman Empire under the likes of Nero and so forth? The atrocities that were perpetrated perpetrated against the Christians and so forth. To preach the gospel potentially meant death. Christianity was an illegal religion. So Paul understood when he talks about to the one we are the savor of death on the death, a life that is squandered and wasted, preaching a meaningless message about some fictitious myth, a dead Jew, so on and so forth. Paul says, I glory in the cross. And it, that's the place where the world's dead to me. And I, in turn, am dead to the world. Galatians chapter 2. And then we're going to Galatians chapter two to live unto him. Galatians, you know, I. I want to be careful. Something sometimes I'm, I'm bothered a little bit. I hope you don't think that unless you die as a martyr, your life was a waste. <laughs> I, I, I want to be so careful with that. The Apostle Paul. His judgment was, his willful decision was, he was willing to do that. He was willing to magnify Christ. How? In death, that type of death. The, the, uh, the, the service and the ministry that, that eventually did, by the way, result in his death. But that doesn't mean that 
you know, unless you're willing to die physically, then you really aren't living for the Lord, that your life really is nothing but waste. Um, back in 2012, my, my mom, she had uh, a stroke. She had seizures. She had a stroke and so forth. So she's in the hospital. And uh, she was there four days, four nights, and so forth. And uh, while she's in the hospital, uh, the next day, a, uh, another patient, another elderly woman is wheeled in, and now we have uh, a roommate, right? And uh, that evening, that lady that was wheeled in, she was just inconsolable. She was just falling apart at the seams. She was just sobbing and in tears. She, she was just falling uh, in pieces. You know, it's hard not to eavesdrop when they're only 10 feet away. So what do the, what do the, nurse, the nurses, they pull the, the curtain, right? Like that's really going to, you know, make things private. So, you know, I'm sitting there. My mom, she's out of it. And, and you know, I can't help. But why is this woman just out of control? Um, it turns out terminal cancer, um, they're only giving her a few months. And uh, family came in. They're trying to help her. They're, you know, friends are coming in. Finally, they brought a couple of doctors in. And the doctor basically said, there is nothing we can do, right? And this poor elderly lady, all she could say was, I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. And, you know, they're trying to do their best. Well, don't worry. You know, you're going to have hospice, and they're going to make you as comfortable as possible, and you've got a network of friends and relatives and so And And you know what? She's just out of control. I'm, 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 I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Long story short, I go home that night, and, you know, I'm laying in bed, and, and you know, I, I can't stop hearing that. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. Next morning, come in, visit mom. She's out of it. And uh, her name, her, her roommate, I, you know, I didn't mean that, but, you know, she's out of it. And uh, so I, I, I walk up, and, and I, I, her name was Mary Durant, and I said, you know, I, I just I got to tell you, I didn't mean to eavesdrop, but I just couldn't help overhearing. Uh, you know, I mean, I know you were very upset, and I know you're just terrified. And I said to her, I said, you don't have to be afraid. God doesn't want you to be afraid. So I gave her the gospel. She gets saved. And then the next day, I did like an Oscar Wilde. You know how Oscar always talked about, you know, I want to make sure it wasn't a stillbirth. You know, so, so you know, the next day, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm talking to Mary. Again. Mary is saved. And, and Mary... Um, she wasn't crying. She wasn't freaking out. She wasn't falling apart at the seams. She wasn't panicking. She, 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 she waved me over. I'm trying to visit my mom. So she waves me over and, and, and she was just was grateful. And that's when I made sure it wasn't a stillbirth. Clear testament, clear testament. She has a cousin that came in from Indiana and she says to her cousin, she says, Hey, I want uh, you to tell my cousin what you told me about Jesus. So now she's trying to, long story short, um, she's released, okay? And um, she had, literally, she had a few months. She died five months later, okay? And uh, turns out, I did her funeral, by the way. Her husband calls and said, hey, can you do her funeral? I said, I'd be more than honored to do her funeral. But before that, I visited her. And her husband calls and says, listen, she's really having a hard time. I, I visit, she's bedridden, okay? You know, oxygen, so forth, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and I... I Gave her some passages, calmed her down, comforted. And now she's beginning to, 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 to learn, to understand. To, there, there's now a joy and a peace. And, and so she settled down, okay? Uh, she's dead. I shared all of this with a guy at church. And, and he said, wow, you know, she was a believer for only five months on earth. Five months. And, and by the way, this gentleman I was talking to, he meant, well, he says, boy, she won't have a whole lot to show for, you know, at, at the judgment seat. And I said, well, and I understood what he meant. You know, I mean, his point was, you know, uh, thank God she's saved. But, you know, five months, that's all she had on earth. And I got to think, was her life a waste? You know, you think about this. Our Heavenly Father wants us to be loved by him. You know, when a believer when, when a child of God is, is comforted, when a child of God is strengthened, when a child of God uh, possesses that, that, that peace, that assurance. You see, Mary, for the last five months of her life, she didn't revert back to her past. She didn't lay there wallowing in her past. She didn't wallow in the shame and, and in the guilt of her past. You, you know what she chose to do for the short time she had on earth? 
She chose to just rejoice in a loving God. She chose to enjoy forgiveness of sin. She was at rest knowing she is eternally secured. And and you know what? That's not a waste. She didn't live under herself for those few months at the end of her life. By just valuing what God says about you and choosing to think in light of what God says about you. The love of God being shed abroad in her heart. No, I'll leave the judgment seat to Christ. But her life wasn't a waste, even though she was bedridden. Galatians chapter 2, we'll close it here. Galatians chapter 2, now ultimately living unto him that loved us. Paul, of course, he sums it all up. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Positionally, old guy. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Now, Paul, he's going to shift gears a little bit. Notice what he does. And the life which I which I now live. This is the judgment. That this, is, this is Paul's determination here. He understands the positional reality of the cross. You know, I'm dead in Adam. I'm alive in Jesus Christ. So what? So what are you going to do about it? I mean, think now, now if, if that's all you want, God still loves you. But Paul went far further than just all that positional truth. He ends verse 20 by saying, and the life which I now live in the flesh. What is he choosing to do? I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me. See the love, the only motivation that's ever going to empower us to live a life that truly reflects and puts on display the splendor and the magnitude of our loving Savior. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, which loved me and gave himself for me. Father, we thank you for your grace and for your love. And Father, may we make that same judgment where henceforth we don't have to live unto ourselves any longer, but we truly can live unto you who's worthy of it all because of that that grace and love which was so freely given to us. We thank you, Father, for it in Christ's name. Amen.